Hi there everybody, Michael Valenti here with the School of Self-Defense in Indianapolis. And I got a feeling this might be a relatively long video, so you know, strap in for that. Um, <laughs> the, um, this video is going to be kind of ranking and talking about the various kind of training equipment that people use in the world of self-defense. Specifically, I'm going to be focusing on the kind of equipment that you might be interested in buying for your own personal gym. I'm gonna be coming at this with um, two really basic assumptions. That first is going to be that you have a training partner. Um, it's very difficult to actually learn self-defense, if not impossible, to learn self-defense without a training partner. So I'm assuming that you have someone to work out with, that you aren't literally completely by yourself. Um, it is imperative that you have a partner to train with. The second assumption that I am making is that you are specifically training for self-defense. So one of the things I always get flustered with in the world of, I guess, YouTube martial arts is people don't seem to understand that street fighting and self-defense are two different subjects. Self-defense is you protecting yourself against an assailant. You do not want to fight. You've not agreed upon this fight and you're generally trying to get away. A street fight is when you have agreed to fight someone in the streets. So having said that, um, let's go ahead and get into this. Oh wait, there is one more thing that I'm gonna mention before we get into it, and that is um, we will not be covering any bodybuilding gear. So we won't be talking about dumbbells or um, resistant bands or anything like that. We're specifically talking about the martial arts part of things. So the way I have this divided up is into these five sections. At the top is must-haves for your home gym. Next is a nice-to-have, uh, specific training this could be a must-have or nice to have but it's I'll explain as we get into it but there's certain things that are really good to have if you are training very certain things um, then you have not that great and then don't get this not that great doesn't mean that it's something that is worthless it just means like uh, you know there's probably something better out there than what what you got here and then don't get this as straight up like I don't really think I think this is either a waste of money or a waste of time so let's go ahead and start off with the first one here, which is a throwing dummy. So anytime you're studying self-defense, it's really important that you know how to take someone to the ground. One of the things that drives me really nuts in the world of martial arts is how often I hear self-defense practitioners say that we should never go to the ground in a self-defense situation, that we should avoid grappling, we should avoid ground fighting altogether but then they have no actual knowledge of how to prevent someone from taking you to the ground. I assure you that if I took someone who trained a whole bunch um, in a striking art, let's just say, you know, kickboxing, and I took someone who trained a whole bunch in a grappling art, let's say judo, and then, um, I, then I had a random stranger try to put them on the ground or a martial artist try to put them on the ground, the judo person actually has a better understanding of how to prevent a takedown than just the striker who's never trained grappling. So it's really important that you um, study grappling, even especially if you intend not to grapple in a street fight, because the only people who can really stop a grappler reliably are people who know grappling. Having said this, a throwing dummy, um, so stiff legs, throwing dummy, they're really fun. They're you know, you pick them up, you toss them around, you can get on top of them, you can do ground and pound. This particular model with the extended arms, uh, you can practice arm bars and gift wraps and things like that. But having said that, I really generally feel throwing dummies, you kind of outgrow them very, very quickly. So I, I, I probably put them in the not that great category just because the initial, um, initially having a throwing dummy is really fun but ultimately they're very limited because they just kind of stand up. They, you can't adjust their limbs or anything like that. And they basically really only work for that one very specific task. And in my opinion, you tend to outgrow throwing dummies really, really quick. Throwing dummies are nice to have if you own a martial arts gym, um, but if you're for your home gym, uh, throwing dummies, they're not that great. So next up would be the, um, I think this is called like the Bob XL. I want to say, uh, but what this thing is, <laughs> um, there's a product called a Bob, which is that we have one down here, um, which is basically a punching bag that has a face and 
um, it, they're really, really great. And I'll talk more about them specifically when we get to Bob. But this guy, he's got the legs that allow you to kick the legs. Um, and he's got the arms so you can trap around the arms. And then he, and then he has the rest of the no normal Bob structure. He's actually kind of like a throwing dummy, except for there's a little bit more to him than uh, what's here. Um, I think that the positive sides of this guy is the fact that you can work target oriented striking. So, you know, he has eyes, he has a definitive throat, he has definitive jaw lines, so you can practice your hooks and your eye strikes and, and what have you. And he has the arms that you can work around. And also just because of the shape of them, uh, I've got to work out with one of these. Just so you guys know, I've generally uh, worked out to an extent with every piece of equipment that we have here. Um, I'm not really going to talk about much of things that I've, I've never trained with. Um, I will tell you with these guys, they're really fun to throw. Um, but I'm really going to have to put them in the specified training, or the specific training category. And the reason for that being is that they are very expensive for what they are because they're effectively a punching bag that you can throw. Um, you can kick the legs and things like that. I think they're pretty cool, um, but they're they're very, very expensive. I kind of want to put in the nice to have just because they are nice to have that if you have one of these, it's nice but they're just, they're hella expensive. And um, it's hard to, to recommend something that's so expensive with something like a punching bag um, usually is, you know, a hundred dollars. <laughs> and these things are usually a lot more expensive. All right, next is a hanging heavy bag. Um, I could not give this product a more ringing endorsement. Uh, if I could put a tier above this tier, that's what I would do. The Standard heavy bag is the single most important piece of at-home training equipment when it comes to be, uh, being a martial artist. This is where you develop your striking power. This is really where you develop your striking alignment. This is, uh, this is really where your ability to strike is developed. Um, this is, if, if there is only one piece of equipment on this list that you bought, it would be this one right here because I think everything else you could you could do without and still manage to train uh, martial arts. But the thing is, almost no one is ever going to let you strike them as hard as you can. And the punching bag lets you do that. Um, I can't stress enough. They're, they're really awesome. The only caveat I'll put to this is if you are an adult, you want 75 pounds or higher for your bag. They sell these at like 50 pound bags. And those are too light to develop power. I like I said, about 70, 75 pounds and up is good to go. Um, also, they come in a lot of different varieties. I like the ones that have the leather or fake leather on the outside so it doesn't scrape up my hands. And um, that usually have a sand core and uh, old rags and cloth as the uh, filling. They make these where they have canvas and sand. Those things are pretty awful they tear up your hands but um, it, those are less and less common because ultimately these kind of leather or faux leather bags are preferred next is going to be a wave master so wave masters are, are really awesome there's a bunch of variations of these wave master is like the brand name and there's a bunch of these but it's basically a standing bag that um either you fill with water or sand or rocks um this serves a very similar purpose to this, except for kind of the two distinct differences is that a heavy bag hangs from the ceiling. So the top of the bag moves less than the bottom of the bag, if that, if that makes sense. And so lots of times, you know, you're kind of always punching. If you're throwing punches at headshot, you're kind of always punching at roughly the same height. And moreover, unless you hang your heavy bag right in the middle of like your garage, you're probably kind of stuck with a very limited kind of movement around these bags. A wave master, on the other hand, because they are upright, the top tends to move and the bottom tends to kind of stay relatively still. And so as I strike the top, it will kind of tilt this way or tilt this way, if that makes sense. And so you kind of get a different thing. But one of the best things you get about a wave master is the fact that you can move around the bag in its entirety. Um, I honestly think that these two things are 
almost interchangeable. I like a heavy bag more than I like a wave master, but it's really, but I, I'm going to put a wave master in this must have category. And I may move it down to nice to have for, for two reasons. One, I really like that you can move all around the bag. That's really important because footwork is probably the most important aspect of self-defense. But the other reason why I really like this wave master is if you live in a place in which you are not allowed to drill holes in the ceiling. So let's say you're renting a house or an apartment. Well, this is a product that you can plop down in the middle of your room and not have to do any damage to the house. Um, so I think those are pretty good for that. Um, these things, they have a hard um, plastic core and kind of a foam on the outside. My experience has been that they've been pretty pleasant to hit, although I will say there is a certain point in which you're hitting these things so hard that they just want to tip over and you don't get that with a hanging bag. So I could put, I'm going to put it here for now. I might move it back up. We'll see. But like I said, this is, they're, they're definitely a good product to get a hold of. So the next is going to be a bob. So I kind of talked about this bob, but this is kind of the classic bob. This one has the pants. Uh, the I think the earliest model of the bob was just from like the waistline up, whereas this one is more from like the knee up or close to the knee up. Um, so if this was a generic, I'm training in martial arts, you know, um, I guess video, I, I would put it in specific training is probably where I put it, but we are specifically talking about self-defense training. And on top of having a heavy bag, um, I really like the idea of a Bob. Uh, I have a Bob and I think most self-defense gyms tend to have a Bob and I like them because they, they have anatomy to them. So you can specifically train self-defense skills. So if you are somebody who plans to throw an eye jab or you plan to strike someone in the throat, um, this helps you learn to target that a little bit more reliably. And be they work just like a wave master where you fill this base with either water or sand or rocks. And, and so they also can kind of will tip around, which also can serve as a sort of um, you know, I can get it moving and strike it while it's moving and help me learn how to target those more sensitive targets. But even if you aren't someone who likes eye jabs and you think eye gouges are bullshit, ultimately when it comes to striking, it's important to hit your target. The hitting at the proper point on the jaw or hitting at the proper point on the nose or even hitting like the orbital bone, um, hitting the liver, hitting the floating rib. All of those are things that need to be trained and a bob can definitely serve as a great way when you're at home to kind of work that accuracy. Bobs are also adjustable so you can work different heights and I, th I find that to be very useful um, just because you know if you're somebody who's maybe you're training high line kicks which generally aren't considered self-defense but if you're training high line kicks you can adjust his height and, and work on targeting different parts like okay I'm going to target the jaw with this kick but I'm going to target it against a you know, five foot 10 guy and then a six foot guy and so on that I can, I can elevate a Bob to, uh, to be a pretty tall dude. Okay. So next up is a rubber training knife. Um, I'm going to be talking about the rubber training knife in the way that I am because there is a metal folding training knife down here. So a rubber training knife seems like in the world of self-defense, that this is what we want to get, that we want to, we want to have this. Once again, you're training with a partner and in self-defense knives become a problem. Knives are going to be a part of a self-defense situation. I think it's really good to train with, um, some sort of additional weapon. So, you know, if you're rolling, maybe give your partner a, a knife so that they can pull it on you randomly and you get a sense for what happens if a knife suddenly shows up in the middle of a grappling match. Um, the problem with the rubber training knife, the idea of the rubber training knife is so that I can stab you and not hurt you. Um, the problem with the rubber training knife is because it is rubber, it doesn't act like a knife. Now, one thing I want to make really clear is that knife disarms are probably about 80% bullshit. There is about 20% of like the idea of knife disarms that if you have grabbed the wolf by the ears, you should not have done this. You have to have some way to deal with it. So if I, if I've grabbed a hold of this person's arm and I, I have this knife in front of me, it's good to have a plan when you make stupid decisions. And that's where knife disarms go. 
They don't go as a, uh, your, your goal is never to like engage with a knife and disarm it. It's that you've done something stupid and now you've got to get your way out of this stupid situation. And the problem with rubber knives is they don't act like knives. There's a lot of techniques, stripping techniques and what have you. And um, for example, Kenpo and Kali that a rubber knife will just bend, but a real knife will be ejected from the hand. And I don't like that at all. Um, so I'm going to put this as a not that great. I'm not going to say a don't buy this, um, but they aren't that great. It's kind of a, once again, the similar thing here that you're going to outgrow that really quickly because ultimately they aren't that versatile. Okay. So next is going to be a wall bag. So a wall bag is generally going to be used for knuckle conditioning. You're going to see this primarily in, uh, arts like Wing Chun. The idea is that you fill these, these three canvas bags with various materials like, you know, you fill them with sand or rocks or, you know, pebbles or beans or whatever, and you strike them. And by striking them, you condition your hand to the activity of striking. Um, this is old school. It's very fun, but it's also really stupid. And the reason why it's really stupid is literally all the conditioning you get from a wall bag, you'd get from a punching bag. And I think we may, we may, I may end up saying that again. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, but I can definitely tell you that, that if, if you have a heavy bag and you strike it bare knuckle, you will develop the same conditioning you get from a wall bag. Um, wall bags are generally cheaper than heavy bags, but I've already said a, a heavy bag is a must have. So if you are making your own personal at home dojo, you have a heavy bag. And so the, the wall bag just, I don't know, it's just, it, it's, it's not necessary. So does it do its job? Yes, but it's antiquated. It's no longer really needed now that we have uh, such great tech as the heavy bag. All right. So what's our next guy here? Well, our next dude is a metal training knife. Oh, look, he's, he stays black. That's pretty cool. We have a metal training knife. Um, this in particular is a folder, and I think that's really good to have. So when I train Kali, um, we train with metal knives, but they're huge. So like I hold the handle and the, and the knife goes all the way out to like here. Uh, when I train Kali, um, we use these big knives, but to be honest, like most people don't walk around with these giant butcher knives. They, they if, if you're going to encounter a knife, you're going to encounter a smaller, like two or three inch knife. Um, and that's may probably going to be a folder. Um, so I think these are really good. Why do I like these more than these rubber ones? Well, there's several reasons. The first is that they're metal and so they don't bend. And because they don't bend, um, if you're pra if you are practicing some kind of disarms, which once again, we don't ever seek the disarm disarms are something you do when you've already made a shit ton of awful mistakes. Um, but you get a realistic sense of what it feels like to pressure down on a metal knife and that, and you understand how stripping a knife actually works. Um, but I also like these little metal folders because if you carry a knife, there's a fairly strong chance you're carrying a folder. Now folders aren't necessarily the best self-defense knives because they have a draw to them. You have to pull them and open them. But let's be real. If you're carrying a knife, the vast majority of knives that one would carry are going to be folders. And so it also makes sure it makes sense if you're going to carry a knife and using it for self-defense is a potential thing you're going to do. It's good to have a analog for that to have when you're training at home. Um, so once again, I think it's really, I think this is, this is probably in the must have as far as self-defense, assuming you carry a knife. If you don't carry a knife, put it in the nice to have, but I'm going to assume that a lot of self-defense people carry a knife. And if, if you carry, then you must train with what you carry. So I'm going to put that in the must have. The next is going to be snap caps. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with guns and I'm not an expert on guns at all, um, I have, I have a decent understanding of them, but, <laughs> but I'm definitely not like a, I'm not like a NRA instructor or anything. Um, a snap cap is basically a fake bullet that you can put into your gun that allows you to fire your, your gun, um, and eject a bullet, um, uh, with, without damaging your gun. Cause you may, you may or may not know this, but, but firing your gun without any bullets in it is, is really bad for your gun. 
Uh, so this allows you to pull the trigger and and e eject the, the, the round or, or what have you. you. It allows you to do all of that without damaging your gun. Um, I want to make it really clear. Um, it is very important that even if you are training with these, you never point a gun at a person. So even if, even if, you know, everybody knows this thing is clear, everybody's checked it, you still never point a gun at a person. So why are these things important? Well, it's good to practice drawing and firing. Um, and a lot of ranges won't let you do that. Um, and it's also good to practice uh, maneuvering through your house. So if you carry a gun, one of the most valuable skills in having a gun is home protection. I, I, I've said in another video, but I don't think guns are great self-defense because most self-defense situations happen from so close and so quickly that a gun's very difficult to get to. Uh, but I say that they are phenomenal spatial defense tools. Well, how is it that I can practice clearing my house? That means that you're going through your house and making sure that there aren't any bad guys anywhere if I'm, uh, if I'm not able to uh, use my gun. There's a lot of really cool drills you can do with these snap caps. Uh, you can look them up online. Um, once again, anytime we're talking about training self-defense with a gun, you always want to seek out a professional. Most uh, shooting ranges will offer courses and what have you in this subject. I strongly recommend uh, taking part of those. If you own a gun and you aren't trained in it, uh, you are a liability to yourself and everybody else around you. Please get as much training as possible. Um, so I'm going to put these in the actual nice to have category. I know that, that that probably feels like very specific training based off what country you're in. Uh, but I live in the United States and I teach in the United States and the vast majority of my audience is in the United States. So we're going to talk about you own a gun and you have to have some way to train with your gun um, and snap caps work for that. OK, next is going to be kicking paddles. Um, and I, I'm kind of throwing things like, you know, up here just because, you know, that's that's just where my mouse goes. Kicking paddles. I do not like kicking paddles. Some people love them. If you do Taekwondo, you're probably always kicking on kicking paddles. I don't like them. Why don't I like kicking paddles? Well, so kicking paddles are kind of like focus mitts, except for, you know, the, the pad holder just holds them with their hand and, and they'll clap. Some people will call them clappers. Um, <laughs> but I don't like kicking paddles because they train accuracy, but there's not really a lot of feedback. And I've actually seen people get injured hitting these things too hard because um, there is no feedback. One thing to understand about strikes is that strikes are intended to hit resistance. That throwing a full force punch in the air can damage your shoulder or a full force kick in the air can damage uh, your legs. These kicking pads paddles work great for developing targeting. Um, and they, they are really nice on a trainer because I'll be real, holding focus mitts does does a does some work to your shoulder um but ultimately i think these paddles uh they teach you how to have really snappy strikes but not very powerful strikes and i think you can develop a snappy ability to strike using other tools um so i'm gonna say mm, don't get these um or maybe or maybe not that great um i'll put them in not that great i don't i don't want to say that they're completely useless um but i'm saying i'm gonna say they're not that great okay next up focus mitts Focus mitts, um, if you are training with a partner, you need focus mitts. Um, something that uh, Paul Vunak, who's one of the kind of uh, real famous Jeet Kune Do instructors, he has a, a million DVD series. But one thing Paul Vunak says, which I always like, he says that a fighter isn't built through techniques. A fighter is built through drills. So if you can learn 100 like self-defense techniques you know all right if a guy grabs you like this you do xyz but drilling is really what makes a fighter and for your striking focus mitts are extremely important they serve the same kind of purpose as a paddle except for you can hit them a lot harder um and i like focus mitts too because they are kind of glove shaped and so this allows the pad holder to help you work head movement and work defensive techniques and then immediately go into striking I like these a lot. Uh, I heard that back in the day, I don't know why there's a shoe next to to me, but back in the day <laughs> when people couldn't afford focus mitts, they would like hold a shoe and people would hit the shoe instead. Um, that's pretty fun. But um, I, I think these, if you're training with a partner, 
uh, yeah, these are a must have. Uh, focus mitts are really, really big. Um, it, it's, it, you know, I guess you could put them in the nice to have because you could kind of work the same thing on people's hands, but really these are going to greatly improve your training because it allows you to learn how to work different targets, work different angles. You can hit these really, really hard as long as your pad holder is a good pad holder. And like I said, you can work your head movement and defense against strikes um, at the same time as working your striking. Um, pad holding is an art form in and of itself. So uh, if you are working with someone else, it's important that both of you guys have learned how to pad hold. And once again, there's a million videos in that, of that online. Next is gonna be blocking um, bats, I guess is what we call these. So I, I hate these. Uh, <laughs> um, I think these, the, these are a replacement for your hands, which I don't get. So if I'm training with you and I want to teach you how to block, the way that I teach you how to block is I throw punches at your face. Now, I don't necessarily have to throw the hardest punch or the fastest punch at your face. Um, and that's kind of what these are here for so that I can swing faster punches at somebody um, without hurting them. But my thought is that anybody who's trained for a long time in martial arts knows that whenever you learn something new, you practice it slowly at first and then you gradually build up the speed. So if I can't throw a punch at you quickly, then you aren't ready to have a punch thrown at you quickly. So with this piece of equipment, it's just, it's kind of just a waste of money. Do they do their job? Absolutely. But kind of like how this is, this can be replaced with a punching bag. This is even worse. This can be replaced with your hands. If I don't want to hit you hard while, while helping you work on defense, I can just leave my hands open so I can throw like this and like slap at you and things like that. Or once again, we can work this with a focus mitts. Um, maybe there's something about these that I don't know, but anytime I've ever seen these worked, worked or worked with them, it's always just been a replacement for someone's arms. And ultimately I think that's just kind of silly. Okay. So next is going to be a rubber gun. Um, once again, I'm, I see that down here we have a blue gun. Oh, you can't see that. I'll move it over here. Look, we have a blue gun over here. So I'm going to talk about the rubber gun. Well, the rubber gun, I have feel the same way as I feel about the uh, rubber knife that you're going to outgrow this really quickly. It's nice to have an analog for a weapon when it comes to training self-defense, especially if you carry one, which I'll get into more when we talk about the blue gun. But the rubber gun is almost always going to be used to practice disarming. And the problem with practicing a disarm on a rubber analog is that the rubber bends in ways that the actual product will not and so you don't actually get a sense for what it's like to manipulate that weapon there are things that work against metal objects that will not work against rubber objects and rubber objects are more forgiving than metal objects when it comes to mistakes um, so I'm not a big fan of the rubber guns because you don't get a realistic sense for what it's like to get these things in your hand. Um, so ultimately, if you can't afford a blue gun, a rubber gun can work, but I just don't think they're that great because there's much better products out there that are going to be more realistic. It's very important for me to emphasize that we never, ever point a real gun at a human no matter what unless we intend to kill that person so you if you want to practice against a gun you need an analog but the rubber gun is not going to be um very realistic as far as what disarming feels like so this picture is kind of cut off but what this picture is is a taser knife now some people use this as a self-defense tool in and of itself but one thing that people use this for is they use it for self-defense training. So I want to train against a knife and I want to have the fear of God put into me as this knife is coming at me. So I'm going to have a less than lethal weapon swung at me. Um, I'm going to be as blunt as I can with this. You don't play with real weapons. A taser is a real weapon. So um, don't get this. Um, or put it over here. Don't get this. Uh, it may scare the shit out of you. It may be less than lethal, but ultimately we don't play with weapons. I assure you being hit with a metal knife hurts really, really, really fucking bad. If this doesn't put the fear of God into you, neither will this. Um, you know, when you get hit with a metal knife, it's no fun. 
Um, the only, the reason why this is down here, like I said, it's a principle based things. A taser is a weapon. We don't play with tasers. I don't think you should go around macing your friends or tasing your friends any any much any more than I think you should go around. You know, I don't know, taking a stick and smashing it into someone's head. We don't play with weapons. Don't buy this. Um, this is what I call big dick martial arts. It makes you feel like a big man, but ultimately you're just training dangerously and stupidly. All right. Next up is the aqua bag. So it's it's kind of fun. We, we that we went through a lot of kind of uh, very self defense specific, but this is this is a product that's really popular in boxing gyms uh, around the world. Aqua bags are interesting because what they are is they're like a punching bag and they kind of hang there and they and they they have a I'm not sure like a rubber outside and they're just filled with water and they're really fascinating because they don't move like a punching bag. Uh, punching bags kind of will swing or jump or seize and dent. Um, Whereas the aqua bag really stays still um, and it doesn't really move much at all. The benefits of an aqua bag is the fact that because it is circular, you can work a lot of different angles on it with your strikes. The downside of an aqua bag is that if you do just about anything other than punch or elbow it, it hurts you back. If you've ever thrown like a hook kick or uh, that's what we call roundhouse, a roundhouse at a aqua bag, that hurts hurts if you've ever done a palm heel hook which is a really super slap against uh aqua bag that hurts really 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 bad um i'm not gonna say they're complete hot garbage but i am gonna say that they're not that great because if you're just practicing your punches they're awesome they're nice to have if you're practicing self-defense in which you're going to be using a lot of open hand strikes um <laughs> they hurt you they hurt um but uh, they they make for a great prank in a uh, in a gym. You tell someone to go and slap that as hard as you can, and it's hilarious. Uh, no, it's awful to be honest. Don't do that to somebody. Okay, so next one is um, like a, a target tree. Um, there's a lot of different versions of this. I think this is the Boss Rootin one. Um, that these are about kind of helping you work different targets. And um, I'm gonna put this in the don't get this category. Um, because much like with the wall bag is just a punching bag, uh, but with less versatility, um, I feel the same way about this, that this is just a punching bag or focus mitts with less versatility. Um, this is the kind of product that seems really good in concept. You're like, oh, that's really cool because I can work this and then cut my angle and work this and cut my angle and work this. But ultimately, you are still just standing right in front of it. So if you are working on shifting your different angles of attack, ideally, you're going to be working that with focus mitts against a human body that's moving around with you. If you're just working on targeting, striking with accuracy, something like a bob will do you much better for a similar, if not much lower price. You buy them used. These are used all the time because people buy them all the time and thinking they're going to get in boxing and don't. Um, and then if you're just looking to hit hard, well, once again, the heavy bag does that job. Yes, these are, these are, this is one product that theoretically does all three, but it doesn't do any of those three as well as those three do on their own. Um, so I'm going to say this is more of a gimmick. I wouldn't spend my money on this. Okay, so I'm probably going to say this wrong, but this is a Makiwara board. It's effectively a board that sits up with like rope wrapped around it and that you work that to condition your knuckles, to learn how to make your, your, your hands nice and strong. Um, I could put this in either specific training or in the don't get this. Ultimately, you're normally going to build these yourself. Uh, so normally, you're not going to buy these. Um, if you are studying a style of karate that works these, I think these are uh, important because this is a part of your history. This is a part of how your art developed. This is a part of training it. Um, they're also just kind of badass. They're fun to use. It's fun just to hit this thing and like get that like soreness on your hand and build up that, mu that strength. I'm not going to put this in the don't get this because it's not really expensive it's it's effectively a piece of wood you know it's a it's a plank that you punch um but it's more specific training i can never stress enough that all you really need to condition your knuckles is to hit a heavy bag without your gloves and then over time you will develop conditioned knuckles i assure you um 
but you know these are these are fine for some for very specific training if you aren't training a style of karate that specifically uses this go ahead and mentally put this down in the don't get this but ultimately they are such a important part of well not important but they're such an iconic part of certain styles of karate's development i'm going to put in specific training because once again um you know specific tools are, are spilt are built for specific situations Okay, next is going to be the speed bag. The speed bag is the classic, you know, boxing montage tool, and it is fun. They are very fun to play with. There's a million different drills you can do. They tend to give you a really good shoulder workout, but ultimately, I don't understand speed bags. I don't really get how they teach you how to punch because generally speaking, if we're learning how to punch, we're learning how to throw these straight shots like this, and these circular shots like this and then when i see people get on the speed bag they tend to kind of like hammer fist and back fist and pull to the back fist you know there's there there's kind of um they aren't really moving their arms in the way that you actually punch one of the things bruce lee said that i really think is true is that if you want to condition your body for an activity do the activity itself so if you want to get good at kicking kick if you want to get good at punching punch there are things that can help you become a better puncher and better kicker that are like exercises and things like that but ultimately i just i think these are not that great if you enjoy working a speed bag and it's a good workout for you that's awesome but you know people even say oh it's great cardio i don't know i've worked a speed bag for like an hour and barely broke a sweat they they maybe i just suck at them but <laughs> and that's a strong chance there's a strong chance i suck at it ultimately i don't think it's even a nice to have it's it's not that great i think it's a really overweight overrated piece of training equipment all right next up is a kicking shield um i'm gonna put the kicking shield in the nice to have so a kicking shield uh, basically allows someone just kind of hold a pad and that you can strike it with your kicks um, the reason why this is you know a good thing to have around is it's nice to be able to move around and practice your kicks so i can practice my kicks as hard as i want on a heavy bag and i can practice my kicks pretty hard on a wave master or a bob um but as a kicking shield's nice because my my partner can move it around and give me different angles and what have you this is also really great for when you're practicing knees so you get a hold into like a tie clinch and drive your knees so you can practice that ultimately i think i think they're pretty cool um the general downside i guess of kicking shields is that they are held by a human and generally held close to the body and so i still can never really kick this as hard as i possibly can because i run the risk of hurting my partner and i wouldn't want to do that um, but you still can kick them a lot harder than lots of times you can kick on focus mitts because with focus mitts your partner has to be fairly accurate so i guess that's my two cents i like them i think they're fun uh they're nice to have that's why it's in there right all right next up is a double-ended bag the old school speed bag um this is in my in my like world this is a must-have i love the double-ended bag so you know the speed bag you know is all about like working accuracy and hand-eye coordination this does all of the same things but using the actual moves that we use in fighting so you're actually hit it with proper punches you can even hit it with some light kicks and with some elbows there's a lot of different tools that you can use i mean you can hit this with elbows too uh but but the the cool thing about it is so with a speed bag a speed bag kind of does this how, how do i angle myself does this thing kind of like this so it will move like this whereas what this bag does is it moves like this so it stays on one plane but it moves around all over the place within that plane I really enjoy these when you're working combinations and working hand-eye coordination in the same way that how the speed bag works hand-eye coordination this does too except for it it helps you work hand-eye coordination using the actual moves uh, that you're training with because this responds much more uh, uh, in, in a way that's much more conducive to training your actual like punches and kicks and what have you um so for me like that it feels like a must-have but to be honest i've, I've not always had it <laughs> um that the, uh you know i fell in love with this when i worked at uh well i started by training at a mixed martial arts gym and i eventually started working there as a coach um 
and I spent hours on this bag. I love them very, very, very much. Um, much of what you can train on this, you can train on other things like focus mitts and the heavy bag. But when it comes to solo training, um, you know how, how I was saying, like this can be a replacement for focus mitts. So is this, and this is a much better and more affordable option. This is a, a good product. Um, they're all, so uh, let's see here. So next up is Muay Thai pads, Muay Thai mitts. Um, these could be interchangeable with these, except for I think that focus mitts are a little bit better than tie pads as far as their versatility. So what I like about tie pads is that you can really just hit them as hard as you possibly can, as long as your pad holder is pretty good. So when I'm coaching self-defense, anytime that I'm teaching people uh, kicks, I tend to pull out the tie pads. I think they work excellently for kind of getting the more devastating, hard hitting shots like elbows and hook kicks. And uh, once again, hook kick is just what I call roundhouse roundhouses. Um, it, 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 the like harder hitting shots, tie pads are really great. They tend just to, to absorb the strikes better than focus mitts. And because they cover your full forearm, you don't have to be nearly as accurate as a pad holder. Um, the reason why I don't necessarily like them as much as a focus mitt is because they are kind of big and bulky. And so being a pad holder and like coaching with different punches and kicks uh, and kind of helping them work their defense, they, uh, they, they're just a little bit more awkward that you've it's, I find that this is a lot easier to coach with. Um, but honestly, you know, you get one of these two, uh, you could interchange these if you wanted to, if your own home gym, I just think these are a little bit more versatile than these. Um, but ultimately uh, these are nice to have. I would put it in my collection. Okay, next is going to be some kind of tatami mats, um, crash mats, throwing mats, whatever it might be. If you are training self-defense, you need to be training grappling. I cannot stress this enough that if you are not training grappling, you're fucking up when it comes to self-defense. Yes, it is true that in a self-defense situation, it is best to avoid going to the ground. I must stress that the only people who can reliably, that's a key word, reliably prevent someone from taking them down are going to be the people who already understand grappling. That's how they're going to take them down. You don't necessarily have to be a black belt in jujitsu, but you need like at least a blue belt understanding of jujitsu or, or equivalent in another art. Um, and in order to do that, crash mats or, or tatami mats are really good to have, especially you should be practicing takedowns. You should be practicing throws because once again, it's really difficult to stop someone from taking you down if you don't understand takedowns. And the best way to understand takedowns is to learn them. Um, <laughs> and so having these mats are really, really nice. It also just generally helps prolong your training. Um, for many, many years when I was um, a teenager in Mississippi, we would do martial arts on concrete. And honestly, we'd get thrown on the concrete and it was awful. Um, when I started, when you train on these, it's much nicer. It lets you train for a lot longer and you aren't like sore for the next eight days. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, these are a must have. If you're studying self-defense, you need to have something to practice ground fighting with, uh, on that is going to be comfortable. You don't have to have to have to have things. You can practice ground fighting without them, but you're going to have safer, more productive training. If you do, I'd invest in some. Oh, size does matter with these, though, <laughs> that you want to make sure that they aren't those thin, little paper thin ones. Um, the ones that I use, I use Tiffins and I use about a two inch thick Tiffin throwing pad. That's what I like. Tiffins kind of a sometimes a pain in the ass as a company to work with, but I love their products. All right. Next is a um, padded stick. So next up is a padded stick. Um, yeah, these are really useful. Um, the, not all padded sticks are built equally. Um, some of them are more flexible than others. Some of them are more padded than others. Honestly, buying one of these online is a crapshoot. Um, I would recommend looking into uh, the kind of building equipment that you'll see LARPers use, like live action role playing. But these guys, they'll they're, they'll go to like conventions and do like foam sword fighting and things like that. Um, and it's really nerdy and really fun. Um, but they know how to make equipment that doesn't hurt each other. Um, they do a great job at it and getting a padded stick. That's kind of built in that same fashion will make for more productive training. Ultimately, if you are studying self-defense, it is highly likely you will be attacked with a weapon and sticks and, and variations thereof are part of that. So it's good to have a stick. Um, 
I would put this here if I was only talking about being attacked with a stick. So, because you could also just get a stick and attack and, you know, train against a stick. Have someone swing a stick at you and defend against it. Obviously, it's not that safe, but you could do that. But you should be sparring with your sticks. That if you are training with a stick, you should be sparring with your sticks. Now, you may be saying, well, Michael, you know, you don't have a, the soft thing for this. Well, I personally think you should be punished when you're hit, even when you're sparring with a knife. So I'm all for that metal knife so that when you spar with a knife, you're taking it real seriously. Uh, with a stick, on the other hand, you know, you know you got hit. It's a part of it. And, and honestly, being hit with padded stick still hurts like a son of a gun uh, if you're playing it at full force. I recommend um, getting a padded stick, uh, two padded sticks, so you and your partner can spar, uh, study some Kali or some other uh, weapons-based art that teaches you how to use these and work out with those. Once again, uh, I think it's in, it's if someone is attacking you, it is best that you have a weapon. And so improvised weapons are good, and a padded stick can kind of represent a million different improvised weapons. All right, next up is the blue gun. So blue guns, um, I'm not just talking about the color blue, but the product. Blue guns are awesome. Um, I could put them in either one of these. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this here and then probably move it up here in a sec. So a blue gun is a um, a training gun that usually has a rubber outside, but usually a metal core. They are accurately modeled off of various um, styles of guns. So you can buy one that is a, um, you know, you can buy one that's a Ruger 1911 or a shield. You can buy one that actually is accurate in mold and weight to your gun. So what I will say is I think anyone who trains self-defense should have a blue gun because once again, because they have that metal core, you get a real sense for what it feels like to handle a gun when you're working a disarm or something like that. The area where I move it up here is if you carry a gun. If you carry a gun, you need to know what it feels like to fight with your gun on you. So for example, I have a lot of students who carry and they will carry their gun, uh, you know, back by their kidney. And what I'll do is I'll take out a blue gun um, and I'll put it there with them and then we'll spar with each other. And then he doesn't, they don't draw the gun, but they just feel what it feels like to have that gun on them. And what happens is the second we hit the ground, that big metal thing jamming to their lower spine is so awful that they get up and they go, I'm going to change where I carry my gun. <laughs> um, and that's just been my experience. You guys may have a different experience, but I think it's important to have a realistic gun when training gun stuff. Um, and if you carry, you need to be practicing what it feels like to draw your weapon and aim it at somebody in the middle of an actual fight, in the middle of an actual attack. And so I would recommend getting a blue gun because once again, we never point a gun at a human being unless we intend to kill them. Even if that gun is empty and you've checked it a million times, you never ever point that weapon at a person. So you need an analog. The blue guns, in my experience, have been the closest thing to the real thing because they're bright blue color. It, you won't get them mixed up. Um, and this allows you to have your holster and, ha and you buy a blue gun that's the same model as the gun that you carry. You put it in your holster and you spar and then have to draw at some point. Get the feeling for what it feels like to actually have your weapon on you while you're actually fighting. I can't stress enough, if you always go to the gym in sweatpants and a t-shirt, you aren't training self-defense. It's important that you know what it feels like to fight with the gear that you normally wear. Now, there's nothing wrong with training sweatpants and a t-shirt. I'm just saying that you should train in your everyday wear um, as well. And part of that, if you carry, would be to have that gun. So I'm going to put this here and here, both here. So if you do not own a gun, put it here. That it's good to know how to disarm a gun. Um, it's good to know how it feels to hold a gun. Um, if you carry a gun, put it here. Don't carry a weapon and not train with it. That's really stupid. All right. Next up is a grappling dummy. So we had the uh, throwing dummy, and now we have the grappling dummy. And it's really interesting because um, during the whole lockdown thing, 
um, this became a very debated issue amongst grapplers, particularly the BJJ community, that a lot of people were saying like, well, should we get these dummies because we're all locked down and we can't leave our house and we can't grapple them and my grappling skills are gonna go, go, go bust. Um, and if that's what you're getting a grappling dummy for is to somehow maintain your grappling skills, eh, it's not that great. So, oh, oh, I moved the wrong board. It's not that great. Um, they really aren't. That um, these aren't going to dramatically improve your grappling skills because the majority of your grappling skills are about improvisation. Uh, yes, you have moves. Yes, you have techniques. You have transitions. You have pins. You have submissions. But ultimately, how you string those together is what makes for a great grappler. I've always kind of said that when I go to a jiu-jitsu tournament and I watch the white belts and I watch the black belts, they're kind of winning with the same techniques. They're winning with chokes and arm bars and things like that. But the way they get there is different. The way they move to those techniques and the decisions they make are very different. And that just comes from actually grappling with another human being, which is why a partner is a must have. I should have had a partner here. Yeah, just have a person. Yeah, a partner is a must have for your training. But having said that, when you are kind of workshopping an idea in your head and you have no one to train with, these are sometimes nice. So let's just say you're on Instagram and you see a sick new move and you're itching to try it out. Uh, you know, you can kind of work through the finer details with this thing so that, uh, and then get to your partner. The other area is if you're having trouble with basics, these can be really nice. And so for example, the top mount transition into arm bar. Um, well, to be honest, most people won't sit there and let you armbar them 10,000 times. You know, you, if you have a partner that lets you do that, you know, buy them a house, they're your best friend. Um, but the grappling dummy will. With a grappling dummy, you can sit there and transition, 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 transition. Um, for example, um, I was having an experience where uh, I was rolling with a larger dude and I was kind of, I, I got him in a triangle choke, and but I my transition was really sloppy because his shoulders were really wide. I was having a hard time with him. Um, and so it was kind of on my head and I have a grappling dummy. And so when I went home, I went and I just kind of drilled the setup for triangle choke over and over and over and over again, again, so that I could kind of build those neural pathways so that my transitions would be good. Because what my issue wasn't that my triangle choke was bad, was that my transition was bad and that that kind of the dummy can kind of help you take your basics and just drill them over and over and over again. So you aren't necessarily going to become an excellent grappler with these, but they help you kind of mentally work through some stuff. And once again, I it's fun to grapple and if you and if you have a good imagination, um, the reason why these bent leg ones are better than these stiff leg ones is because these things can be put in more positions. So like you can't be put in his guard. He can't put you in a proper side control. He can't put you in a proper scarf hold. Uh, whereas with this guy, you can kind of set him up so, so and work those basics. Um, if you are a high level judo or jujitsu player, neither of these things will benefit you. These are things for people who are learning martial arts and still are trying to kind of work their way way through some of these basics you will eventually outgrow this but in your early training this is nice to have and like I said even I will sometimes revisit it just because I'll, I'll, I'll get upset about me screwing something up while sparring <laughs> and I'll go like tech it out with him hey man we'll have a conversation um, okay so this is the I think it's a century product it's the versus bag and this is kind of like the uh, wave master except for that um, uh, it doesn't use water, it kind of has like a real simple sand base and a light top. These things, you can't hit them very hard, um, but where I like them, so I, I would put them here. So if you live in like a house, I'll put them here. They're not that great. But I have several students who live in apartments and moreover, they live in the apartments that are upstairs. And having a wave master is great but they crash all over the place. They make a ton of noise that are gonna bother the people underneath you. A heavy bag has to be hung somewhere. So generally speaking, unless you are, are additionally purchasing like a hanging setup, uh, you aren't gonna be allowed to have a heavy bag in your apartment. Whereas what these are, because they kind of have this like, like sand base and they kind of just move around, um, these are great as a kind of punching bag for when you live in an apartment and you don't want to make a lot of noise, which is where I'll put this into specific training. 
Um, I think these are ultimately good in very specific situations, and one of them is going to be just that, where you're in a place in which a heavy bag is not an option and a wave master is not an option. Well, I said the most important gear in martial arts training is a heavy bag, right? Well, I can't have that. I can't have that. This would be the next best thing. Now, this is a, a really nice product. You can move around it. The only downside is you can't hit it as hard as you possibly can. But other than that, I think it's pretty good given uh, you know uh, what your circumstances are. All right. Next up is the Wing Chun Dummy. Um, sure, probably uh, if you're new to my channel, you're going to think I'm going to say don't get this. And if you've been to my channel for a while, you're going to think I'm going to say it's a must-have. Um, but it's actually... Uh, this is going to shock literally no one. Uh, this is a specific training piece of equipment. If you're studying Wing Chun, this is a must-have. You have to have one of these at some point while training Wing Chun. Literally, you cannot go through the entire Wing Chun system without having one of these. It is required. Um, but if you are someone who trains any kind of trapping skills, so whether you know that's you know limb destructions or you know kind of Wing Chun style trappings with like pox sows, lop sows, uh, these are these are really good. They're they're good to have. But these also serve purposes that a lot of people don't think about. So you have this knee, um, and that that's very useful for working transitions into trapping. That I can kick that knee in some fashion and work my way in. But I've actually used these to help straighten up kicks, to straighten up punches. So I, I don't know if you can see this, but like if you can lace your kick in between these two arms, it can teach you how to kind of get your kick to come in really, really straight or to learn how to kick over an obstacle that I'll come and I'll kick over those, those and learn how to kind of uh, navigate around stuff. The two bent arms can help keep your elbows tight because a really good punch, the elbow should be tight. They don't, you don't, you don't pop your punch your elbow out let me angle myself you don't pop yourself out and punch like this you keep your elbow tight and then turn the punch over um and so because those arms are there you can punch in between that and it can keep keep your arms tight there's a lot of valuable stuff with this dummy outside of um just wing chun um, but obviously if you don't have one you wouldn't know that um ultimately you don't have to get one um but i don't think that they aren't great i think they're incredible um but only for very specific kinds of training. Uh, so if you train any martial art that needs these kind of specific kind of training, then they're really good. All right, next up is a red man suit or some variation of. So in women's self-defense courses, in police courses all the time, um, they will put someone in a big, massive, like armored suit that just lets people wail on them. And ultimately, these are dumb. Um, they make you feel really good for no reason. Ultimately, this guy is is not acting like a human being does while he gets hit. Yes, you're fighting some you know invincible man, but uh, which we'll get to here in just a second. But ultimately, sparring is where you're going to learn how to fight somebody, not one of these. Um, if you want to work headbutts, knees, elbows, eye gouges, just do them in sparring, but like nicely. You know, you can fake a headbutt, you can tap an elbow, I can. Um, we'll even sometimes train with goggles on if you want to work some sort of eye striking you can put goggles on and then you can hit the eye now um, ultimately these are I mean they're crazy expensive these red man suits but there's a bunch of variation of of these gear where it just lets people kind of beat the shit out of you and ultimately like ah just spar like just spar for the love of God just wrestle with people and and you'll, you'll learn a lot more than you will with these this is a colossal waste of money um, this makes this kind of reminds me of this. It's kind of that like big dick martial arts. It makes you feel really good because you just oh yeah, I'm gonna beat the shit out of this guy. But ultimately, like I don't know, you're just kind of you're not getting realistic feedback, so they're not that great. All right, last is sparring equipment. That's a must have. Um, if you are not sparring, you are not studying self defense. Um, I don't know what you're studying to be honest, because most martial arts aren't really fully expressed until you fight. You know, you never heard of a swimmer who's never been in the water, right? <laughs> but but for some reason, there's plenty of self-defense guys who've never been in a fight. Um, sparring is very important for studying um, self-defense. Now, one thing people mistake is that they'll spar and they'll say, well, sparring doesn't look anything like self-defense. And you're right. It doesn't. Um, but, you know, neither does, you know, uh, going to the range, standing in an isosceles stance and putting a hole through a piece of paper. That's not how you use a gun in self-defense either. But 
there are activities that are important to your development as a, uh, I guess, as a martial artist. And sparring is one of, if not the most important activities that cardio and obviously just working good technique. Um, if you, but I'll tell you this, if you have one guy who trained in the best martial art in the world for 10 years and never sparred, and then you got another guy who you never teach him any martial arts, but you just, you just make him get into a fight once a day for 10 years. And then the two of them have to fight each other. Who's going to win? The guy who got in a fight every day for 10 years. Well, obviously it's not reasonable or probably even possible to survive um, having an actual fight every day, but you can spar every day. You can spar several times a week. There's a lot of different kinds of training equipment. This right here is showing headgear, shin pad, um, and boxing gloves. I actually like the hybrid gloves. They're like MMA gloves, but they have a big poof on them like a boxing gloves because once again, I also, I, I think you should incorporate grappling. And so having some ability to grapple is nice. So I like the hybrid gloves better than these, but this is just kind of generic. You need equipment to spar. Tap sparring, you know, slap boxing is fine for your first like three or four months of martial arts training. And then from there you need to start hitting people. Um, to actually understand what it feels like to be hit and get hit. Uh, that was the same thing. But anyways, what I'm getting at is <laughs> that, um, you know, if, if, if you're coaching football, you need to have, you know, played football. And if you're studying football, you're, you're going to eventually get into a football game. If you want to learn how to fight, you have to fight. It's that simple. You have to get hit. You have to hit people. You have to know what it feels like to have all that happen to you. Now, it's not the same as, as being in a self-defense situation. It's very different, in fact. But here's a crazy thought. What about if you sparred and put one of these in the mix? Or you sparred and put one of these in the mix? Or you sparred and you put one of these in the mix? Now, now we're training some real self-defense. But you can't do all that until you're used to sparring. you got to first get comfortable with this. So, uh, yeah, spar a lot. Every day. As often as possible. That's all the, that's all the video, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So that was pretty fun. I think, um, hopefully this is way less controversial than my, uh, ranking martial arts for self-defense. Boy, people have strong opinions about that one, don't they? No, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, this is kind of my layout. So let's look at it. So if you are, you know, you're looking to get into self-defense and you're trying to make a home gym for you and your partners to work out with, Heavy bag, training knives, focus mitts, uh, some kind of crash mats, a uh, foam stick, a training weapon, a training gun, and equipment to spar. Those are your must-haves. If you have a crap ton of money that you just want to throw around, we'll go ahead and throw in a Wave Master, a Bob, some snap cacks, a uh, kicking shield, a uh, double-ended bag, Muay Thai mitts, and why not a grappling dummy just to round it off. And what are we staying away from? What don't we get? Well, wall bags, these weird pool noodle things, uh, literally attacking your friends with actual weapons, <laughs> gimmicky training equipment, um, and the red man suit, which is just dumb, too much, too expensive. So stay away from these. That's kind of the conclusion here. Um, if you've made it to the end of this video, which is pretty much an hour long, well, you like my content. So please be sure to thumb to yeah, thumbs up to so give it a like. Uh, leave a comment below about what some of your favorite training equipment is. Maybe if you would place one of these things somewhere different, where would you place it? How would you place it? Um, what equipment did I miss and you'd like to add? I'd like to know all of those things. If you live in the Indianapolis area and you'd like to come train with me, all the information to do that is on our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. Furthermore, if you um, would like to train with me online. We actually have Zoom classes on Wednesdays. And once again, you can find all of that on my website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. So until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Fight on.